Hey, good evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz, coming to you from Los Angeles. And here are the stories we're watching tonight, starting with a secret 60 years in the making that could rewrite one of the most unforgettable moments in American history. President John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time today here in Dallas. He died of a gunshot wound in the brain. Now, a Secret Service agent just a few feet away from Kennedy when he was shot claims to have seen something and done something that day that he's never publicly talked about before. His name is Paul Landis, and he joins us tonight to tell his story. I happened to look uh, to the right where, Ms. Uh, where Mrs. Kennedy was sitting, and sitting in a pool of blood there, I saw two bright uh, brass bullet fragments. And an American trapped more than 3,000 feet underground in a cave in Turkey for more than a week has been rescued. We're going to have the latest on that. And then the escaped inmate who convicted murder Danilo Calvacante is still on the loose after nearly two weeks, and he has changed his appearance. Now officers are hoping a change in strategy will put him back behind bars. Now we're going to prepare for the long game, and the long game is what we do best, the U.S. Marshal Service. And 22 years later, America remembers 9-11. Coming up tonight, we are about to talk to a former Secret Service agent with a secret that, if true, could rewrite so much of what we know happened on the day President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. It is a confession he says he is making after 60 years of silence, all about a single bullet he found in the back of that convertible. Now, the implications could be staggering. There's a lot of fact from fiction that we're going to be separating here. So we want to start with just a little bit of history and take you back to that fateful day in Dallas. In 1963. The motorcade is traveling at about 20 to 25 miles an hour. This, this is the scene of confusion. Something has happened here. The cameraman running toward the scene to the presidential car ahead of him. These films from outside the emergency room of Parkland Hospital in Dallas as the president is dying inside. Senator Ralph Yarbrough, who saw the shooting, said he heard shots and then saw a Secret Service man pound his fist against a rear fender of the presidential car in anguish. White House Press Secretary Malcolm Kilduff has just announced that President Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time, which is about 35 minutes ago. After being shot at... After being shot... By an unknown assailant... By an unknown assailant... During a motorcade drive through downtown Dallas. During a motorcade drive through downtown Dallas. A flash from Dallas. Two priests who were with President Kennedy say he is dead. A bullet wounds. This is the latest information we have from Dallas. Of course to give you all available information as it comes to us. I will repeat with the greatest... And the remains of John F. Kennedy are about to pass a memorial to another president assassinated. Now, the final report by the Warren Commission concluded that three shots were fired. One shot passed through the president's back and exited through his neck. It may have also hit Texas Governor John Connolly, seeming to ricochet inside his body, and that the last shot hit President Kennedy in the head. But here is the thing. The root of most conspiracies surrounding what happened deal with a mystery known as the magic bullet theory, all having to do with the shot that entered JFK's back as doctors told Congress and then again somehow allegedly exited through his neck, then pierced the governor. Sitting there in front of him went through the governor's chest, shattering a rib, then exiting his body, then going back inside to his wrist, went through that and then hit his leg. And that bullet was found intact at the hospital. Now, now, it was always assumed that it fell off the governor's stretcher, but today, that Secret Service agent who we are about to talk to says he's the one who found that bullet and put it on the stretcher. But before we get to him, let's take a quick look at this report from NBC's Liz Kurtz. 
60 years after one of the most earth-shattering days in modern American history, when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas in 1963. John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time. Former Secret Service agent Paul Landis, who was with the president that day, is opening up for the first time about what he witnessed. For decades, the prevailing theory was that one bullet struck JFK and then hit Texas Governor John Connolly, who was sitting in front of him. It became known as the magic bullet theory, which explained how one shooter could have fired all the shots. The theory is based on this bullet being found on Governor Connolly's gurney at the hospital. But now in a new book, Landis says he knows how it got there. The 88-year-old tells the New York Times he found that bullet lodged in the car seat behind where Kennedy was killed. He says he then took that bullet to the hospital and placed it on the president's gurney. It was a piece of evidence, he tells the Times, and I didn't want it to disappear or get lost. So it was, Paul, you've got to make a decision, and I grabbed it. But Landis now says he thinks the bullet may have rolled from Kennedy's gurney to Connolly's, meaning it may not have been the bullet that injured Connolly. Dr. Aguilar, you've studied this case for years. How significant is this? I think this is a significant piece of new evidence to support the idea that there was more than one gunman in Dealey Plaza. Clint Hill, the Secret Service agent who climbed on the back of the limo after Kennedy was shot, questions Landis' story. Why do you have doubts about his account? Because if you check all the evidence, statements, things that happened, they don't line up. It doesn't make any sense to me that he's trying to put it on the president's journey. But Landis, who was not available for an interview with NBC News, tells the Times he made mistakes in his initial reports. He says he's been afraid to share his true story until now. Liz Kreutz, NBC News. Thanks so much, Liz. Paul Landis, a witness to the assassination and author of the book, The Final Witness, joins us now. And James Robinalt, a presidential historian who wrote the profile in Vanity Fair on Paul's book, joins us as well. First off, Mr. Landis, thank you so much for joining us. I can't imagine uh, the trauma of seeing what you saw and then having to relive it for decades. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to us tonight. Um, I know this is decades and decades in the past, but what do you remember starting with the first shot all the way to discovering the bullet? Well, I remember uh, the first shot came from over my right shoulder. I turned around to look to see where it was coming from. Um, I scanned quickly uh, the grassy knoll area that was in front of us or to our right. Uh, I looked at President Kennedy. I did not realize he'd been hit at that moment. He was raising his arms, and I thought he was leaning to the left. I thought he was turning to see where the sound came from. Uh, just after, after that, I scanned quickly to the right, back again. I was looking at the president when the second sound uh, happened. I still did not see any reaction from anybody in the presidential limo. And... At that point, we were approaching the underpass, and I heard a loud uh, report that came very shortly after the second one. Uh, we flew through the underpass. Uh, during this whole time, was the uh, six seconds that, that took place, uh, I saw Clint Hill running, running to the president's limo and reaching to get up on the trunk. Um, he got up there just as Mrs. Kennedy seemed to be reaching out up over the trunk and get, getting back. And Clint pushed her back into the seat, covered the body, and we flew under the underpass. And I had no idea where we were going. I assumed it was the uh, closest hospital available. Uh, we rely, rely, arrived at Parkland Memorial Hospital. Um, I jumped out of the follow-up car and raced up to Mrs. Kennedy to the Mrs. Kennedy in the limo. I reached over and took her by the shoulders and asked her if I could help her. Uh, she said, "No, no, no, no. I, I want to stay with him. I want to stay with the President." Uh, about that time, Clint entered the uh, rear of the car and. Uh, 
I realized that Mrs. Kennedy was hiding the president's head and didn't want anybody to see the head wound. So he, he immediately convinced her he cover, he took off his suit coat, covered her head, uh, his president's head, and they started to get up to leave the, the limousine. In the meantime, while this was happening, I happened to look uh, to the right where, Ms., of where Mrs. Kenny was sitting and sitting in a pool of blood there, I saw two bright uh, brass bullet fragments. I picked one of them up, looked at it, and it was kind of like the end of my little pinky. It was mushroomed, uh, and I put it back right exactly where I found it. And by then, Mrs. Kennedy was standing up, and I was looking around for other agents. I didn't see anybody, but I saw an intact, fully uh, bullet on the back of the seat where the uh, cushioning meets the met the trunk of the car. And I picked it up and looked at it, and it was only thing I noticed that was wrong with it was were bullet striations. There was no other deformities. Um, I started to put it back. Mrs. Kennedy and Clint were leaving the car, and uh, I made a quick decision. I, I didn't see anybody to secure the car. People were emerging on, on the car. Uh, I did not want this piece of evidence to disappear, and I slipped it into my pocket. Um, we raced through the lobby of uh, the, the uh, emergency room. Uh, on the way out of the car, I uh, noticed Mrs. Kennedy's pillbox box hat, her clutch purse, and I picked them up. And then I noticed there was a Zippo cigarette lighter on the street on the seat. It was all covered with blood, and I turned it over and it had the presidential seal on it. I thought it was uh, Mrs. Kennedy. Either came out of her purse. Didn't think anything else of it. But I figured that Mrs. Kennedy didn't need to see this, so I slipped that in my pocket too, and figured I would give it to Prove, her personal maid, when we got back to the White House. Um, as we raced through the lobby of uh, the emergency room. Uh, we got, got to a trauma room one. They had to pivot the uh, gurney that the president's body was on and push it into the trauma room. Um, there was a crowd that kind of joined us doing this. I was pushed right up next to uh, the president's body and standing right next to his feet. Uh, most everybody in the room was focused on the head wound. I could not look. I knew I would pass out if I saw it. Um, but all these things are whirling through my mind on what to do. And I realized this was a perfect just, uh, place to leave a bullet uh, with the president's body, and it would be found during uh, the autopsy. And about that time, so I reached out, I put the bullet on the gurney right by his feet. And about that time, everybody, the doctors were asking everybody to leave. Somebody came in and said, please, please let me through. Uh, I'm a doctor. And somebody else, another doctor, they asked everybody to leave, um, but give them room to work. So we turned and uh, kind of joined the crowd going out of the uh, the uh, trauma room, Mrs. Kennedy had come in and she kind of slipped to the uh, left of the door entrance. So I kind of stood there with her while everybody was leaving. And then I followed her out when she stepped out. Um, I then I spotted Clint and uh, Roy Kellerman uh, in an office to the left. And I walked over to tell Clint I was going to be over with Mrs. Kennedy. And he, he, at that point, he was on the phone. Um, what else from there? Paul, 
Sorry, uh, real fast, Paul. When you found that bullet, this bullet has become the focal point of, of so much history. When you found that bullet, was it lodged in a cushion? You said that it had striations. Uh, was it lodged in the cushion? Was it just sitting on the back of the of the seat next to where the convertible came down? Uh, how would you describe uh, its condition when you found it? Uh, it was perfect condition. It was not buried or sunk in a seam. It was just lying uh, where the seam on the back of the seat meets uh, the middle of the trunk. And uh, it's where they would have attached the bubble top if they had or had, were, were putting it on. And, and you got a good look at it. Did it have any blood or any, any sort of matter on it? I didn't notice any blood. Uh, it was just, it was like everybody wrote or says, it was a pristine bullet. The only thing on it were uh, rifle striations, uh, and that, that's all I noticed at the time. And this was and all. Paul, do, you, do you think? No, I'm sorry. sorry. Do you think that the bullet that you found uh, at the back of the car? Do you think that that one was possibly the one that hit President Kennedy in the back and then may have fallen back out in the second shot, or do you think that that might have been the shot that missed? I know you described only hearing uh, two gunshots. What, what are your thoughts? I did hear three gunshots. You heard three gunshots. So do you think yeah. that it was the one that went in his back, or do you think that this might have, I don't know, been been the other one that, that was never found? I didn't have any thoughts at that time. All I saw was a bullet that was there, and I wanted to preserve it to make sure that it didn't get lost. That's That's basically it. And, and we've heard from Clint Hill, the other Secret Service agent there. Uh, he questions your account, saying it doesn't make any sense to him. Uh, uh, what do you make of that? Uh, I really don't know. That's, that's, uh, that's Clint's theory. That's his thought. We never talked to each other after the assassination about the events. We worked together for the next seven months. Uh, I really can't. Uh, I can't answer what his thinking is or, or why. So many people that are watching this are going to wonder, why come forward now? Why not say something earlier? Well, nobody asked me, and I never thought about it. It was, I didn't read anything about the assassination. I had nightmares. Uh, I buried everything. I refused to read anything about it because I figured I'd been there, I witnessed it, I didn't need to read anything. Uh, all the assassination theories and things that were out there, I never, I never took a look at. It was there was only one book, and it was just coincidentally happened uh, in 2014, and I. Uh, doing volunteer work for the Shaker Heights uh, Police Department. And the chief of the police there called, came to the auction. We were doing a property auction. Police chief came, said, Paul, I have a book that I think you'd be interested in. And he gave me this book, and it was called Six Seconds in Dallas. Uh, I took it home thinking I'd read it, read it immediately, but I just put it on a nightstand, and uh, it was three months before I decided it was time to start reading about what was going on. I don't know. And, and Paul, and Paul, when know. you started to real, when you started to realize that they were calling the bullet that you found the magic bullet, and this whole theory revolved around this one magic bullet, knowing what you knew at the time, what went through your mind? Uh, and this, it was, I said, this was wrong. They, they were attributing that bullet to being on Governor Connolly's stretcher. And uh, I knew I'd picked it up and carried it in and put it on President Kennedy's stretcher. And that, that's, that's really uh, the only thing that had me concerned. I, I, I didn't know what to do about that at the time. And 
And Jim, the way I understand it, you set out, just like all of us journalists, with a, a healthy dose of, of skepticism. Uh, you met Paul, you started asking questions, and the way I understand it, you, you were struck with, with his story, with his candor, and the next thing you know, you, you're acting almost as his confidant before the release of his book here. Uh, what strikes you about his story? Well, first of all, um, the book was done when I read it. He had, he had uh, completed the book. And at the very end of the book, I was like, OK, so what does this mean? Because he does not speculate about anything. He just says what he knows and what he saw and what he found. And so I called the publisher who had published my last two books. Coincidentally, that's why they sent me the book to, to do a blurb of this book. And I said, this guy um, is going to have a lot of people coming at him, asking a lot of questions. I think he's going to need somebody to spend some time with him before we launch. And so Paul and I have met maybe about 15 times, usually two hours at a time. And we've gone over everything. I put him through the paces. You know, why did you wait? Is this possible? You know, that sort of thing. And over time, I became convinced that it was not only possible, but that it was very probable that that uh, this bullet that he's talking about stuck in Kennedy's back and then fell out the back. Uh, the night of the autopsy, those autopsy doctors could only get their little pinkies just a, a short bit into the back wound. There was no outlet and they were perplexed by it. So um, that all changed and that's a different story. But once I started looking at all this, um, having been someone who believed in the Warren Commission, I now thought, well, wait a minute, if this bullet stuck in his back, then it is not the single bullet that went through and then hit Conley and caused all that injury. Um, and it only makes sense because the one that caused Conley's injury broke major bones and it would not have been not severely deformed if not broken into pieces. So um, over time, I, I became convinced that um, this story was true, correct. Um, and I tried to put it all together in that Vanity Fair article that I did. It's a great article. And uh, Paul, I've got to ask you the same question that Jim has probably asked over and over and over again. Do you think that Lee Harvey Oswald was the only person involved? Do you think he was the gunman, the, the sole gunman in the assassination of John F. Kennedy? I think the, uh, the fact that they found three, what I based my decision on was the fact they found three cartridge cases in the school book depository. And I think there was, it had to be one person. And I feel comfortable at this point that that's, that's who it was. And he was the lone assassin. Paul Landis, Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a lot to process there. Really looking forward to uh, reading more on your account. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's too soon to tell how that's going to change theories surrounding such an important moment in our nation's history. But a quick note before we move on, uh, it is not lost on me that this is a chapter of our past that a lot of people would like to learn from and move on. But I got to say, we live in a day and age of rampant conspiracies. And as a journalist, I've always thought that questioning what happens is not something that ends. It's something that we continue to do when the story evolves. I know I, I look young, but in my 19 years of covering the news, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a story change again and again and again. And I've found that accounts that insist that 100% certainty this is what happened can often be as unreliable as those who say, look, there is something that doesn't add up, must be some sort of secret conspiracy. Uh, so I guess the bottom line here is that we always deserve more information just as much as we deserve to keep an open mind. And turning now to some breaking news in Turkey, where earlier tonight, American researcher Mark Dickey was successfully taken out of the cave. He's been stuck inside for a week. Now, this is incredible video we just got in, and that's the moment he was lifted out of the cave on a stretcher. Here's a bit of what he had to say about that whole ordeal. I kept throwing up blood. Um, and then my consciousness started to like get harder to hold on to and I reached the point that I was like, I'm not gonna live. I gotta tell you, I don't know what to say. This is this is overwhelming. <laughs> this is a this is a first. Um, <laughs> make it a last. <laughs> How do you make it a last time too, thank you. <laughs> 
Good to see a smile on his face. The Turkish Caving Federation says he's now at a medical rescue tent, officially ending that cave rescue. And you might remember Dickie was stuck inside the cave after he suffered, uh, suffered those stomach bleeding issues. So in order to get him out, he had to be strapped into a stretcher in a very complex mission. And NBC's Molly Hunter has the latest. Some very, very good news from deep in the remote Taurus Mountains in southern Turkey. Mark Dickey is out. He is safe, we understand, from the rescue operation and from the emergency management authority there that he will be assessed on site by Turkish doctors and foreign doctors. He will then be airlifted by helicopter to a state hospital in nearby Mersin, Turkey. Uh, but there's got to be really incredible relief, of course. This was a mammoth team effort, 190 personnel from more than uh, from eight countries, excuse me, 150 of those personnel were serious search and rescue experts. And you can see in the video, this is the last video of him traveling those 600 feet. It's incredibly technical. It is logistically complex. The search and rescuers have to be extremely competent cavers themselves then to get that stretcher through the pulley system, through very tight passageways, very steep passageways. And you can see in the video, uh, Dickey is basically lashed into this stretcher, completely cocooned, and rescuers call that patient packaging basically preventing him from slipping off in any way as they move him. And you can see the stretcher kind of heaving and rocking as it's going through very tight passageways. We're also told unbelievably that that video, the last 600 feet, actually a slightly more mild incline than those first couple thousand feet, which was very vertical. Rescuers had to use small explosives, had to use hammers to basically blast Mark Dickey out. But some very good news. We do not have a medical update. We do not know exactly what state he is in, but he is alive and he is out of that cave. Molly Hunter, thank you so much. Now to Morocco, where the death toll from that horrific earthquake has now crossed 2,600 people and more than 2,500 people are hurt. And the death toll is unfortunately expected to rise dramatically in the coming days. Now, the 6.8 magnitude earthquake hit Friday night, causing widespread damage with buildings and homes completely razed to the ground. Rescuers are desperately searching for survivors as the U.N. is estimating that nearly 300,000 people have been affected. From our partners at Sky News, Stuart Ramsey has the latest. Battered and bruised, but alive. High in the Atlas Mountains, a survivor carried out by soldiers. Many thought it would take a miracle for people to be alive up here. This was a day of miracles. Cut off for days with no help, these communities had to wait. Finally, it arrived. Slowly but surely, they're carried down when they're found. The earthquake destruction of some of these mountain villages was complete. Just a handful of people escaped from this town. Everyone else died. The rescued are put onto trucks to begin a journey down the mountain to the valley floor and medical treatment. The people are now coming off the mountain. It's taken the rescue teams a long time to get here. So, but uh, they're getting off injured. They haven't been there long. But uh, people are now coming out. Many thought there would be no survivors here, but there clearly were. They've been able to dig them out. They've come down, but there'll be no doubt other teams going up. As I say, many thought that this community in particular, and it's taken us a long time to get here, everyone would be dead, but they're clearly not. Some had given up waiting. With what they could carry, they walked in some cases, for a day, just to get to towns that themselves have only just been reached in the past few hours. The survivors all have terrible stories of fear and loss. My house fell down, gone. It collapsed on me and my family. I rescued my two daughters and their mother, but I lost my other two children, and I have no furniture, nothing left. The speed of the rescue operation has been criticised here. They're still having to deliver aid to remote areas by helicopter. The roads are impassable. But even this can be traumatic for the survivors. They're dropping aid so low, the wash from rotor blades destroys what's left of a home already damaged in this earthquake. The military has realised that with the mountain roads so dangerous, they have no choice but to deploy the army on foot. 
We joined them as they began their mission to reach towns and villages that still have nothing. We soon discovered that wherever they could get to, people were in desperate need of help. Neza and her husband Rashid just couldn't stay in their village. She is nine months pregnant and couldn't have a baby in the ruins. I came with him today because there's no place left to stay. I left my parents there in the village. I don't know if they'll be alive or not. I don't know if I'll see them again or not. And my brothers and sisters also. There are dozens more villages and towns like the ones we reached, battered and without power or water. When the rescuers arrive, the last survivors are taken away. Very soon, they may not find anyone left to rescue. Incredible reporting. Stuart Ramsey, thanks so much. Now, escaped inmate and convicted murderer Danilo Calvacante is still on the run, and guys, a lot happened over the weekend. On Saturday night, Calvacante stole a van that's allegedly from a dairy farm and drove like 20 miles up north to this area where, get this, he tried to get into contact with two former co-workers, one in East Pikeland Township and one in Phoenixville. Now, he couldn't get into contact with either, but one of the co-workers reported the incident to police and shared a ring camera photo. It shows Calvacante there with a new appearance. He's now clean-shaven, sporting a greenish hoodie, baseball hat, and still has those green prison pants. And police later found that van, but no Calvacante in sight. They think he is somewhere in Pennsylvania. And NBC's George Solis joins us now from Unionville. George, what can you tell us about what happened on Saturday night and, and where does the investigation stand right now? Yeah, Gotti. So a couple things happened on Saturday night. Number one, Cavalcante broke that really fast search perimeter, stealing a van and then driving it about 40 minutes away to the acquaintances he had in that area. He door knocks on one of those homes and then he's captured on doorbell camera. And that's when things really take a bizarre twist here because now they see that his appearance has completely changed. He goes from this guy with a beard, a goatee, to a clean-shaven appearance. Authorities saying he was looking for some kind of help from someone that he used to work with, that person not home at the time. I asked authorities what he sounded like, because this is from a doorbell camera. Authorities have not released the full video or the audio, but they say his demeanor was that of someone who was desperate, someone who was reaching out to someone he clearly hadn't had a conversation with in a long time, really speaking to his desperation to potentially not only just leave the county, but even the state, which is why authorities are confident he's still very much in this area. And even though they don't have a defined perimeter at this point, they are using other methods that they're not fully disclosing so they can close in on this fugitive who's been on the run now for 12 days, Gotti. And George, you spoke to Cavalcante's ex-roommate who lived with him right up until uh, his girlfriend was murdered, right? What, what struck out about that conversation to you the most? Yeah, Gotti, that was a, it was a difficult interview, to say the least, because his roommate, understandably so, is very shaken up. He knows that Cavalcante is now on the run. He's obviously trying to get in contact with people that he knew. He's fearful that he's going to be the next person on that list. So police are keeping very close watch on him. He says he's having trouble sleeping. He's saying his anxiety is creeping up. It was a very uh, interesting interview, to say the least. Here's a little bit more of our exchange today. What was he like as a roommate? Super quiet guy really shy, wouldn't talk much, he wouldn't, st he wouldn't start a conversation, you know, but if, if I start a conversation, he'll talk to me for like few minutes, but I didn't spend, I didn't spend much time with him. I don't know where he's going, I, but I really think he's trying to leave the country, like, because he know his life is done here, like, if, he's, if he goes to jail, that's it. And God, I asked him if Cavalcante at this point has had any contact with him. He said, absolutely not. He says if he even attempts it, he'll immediately call authorities, Gotti. Yeah, meanwhile, that search area is now pretty much everywhere. George Solis, thanks so much. And still to come, a controversial gun ban in New Mexico. We've got the details on why gun owners are furious. And later this hour, Bill Gates, Sam Altman, and Mark Zuckerberg are all headed to Capitol Hill. And you can probably guess what this is going to be about. Yep, regulating AI. We'll see. This is not going to be easy. In fact, it will be one of the most difficult things we undertake. 
Hey there, welcome back. And here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. The FDA approved updated COVID boosters from Pfizer and Moderna today. And anyone five and older can get this updated shot meant to target the latest subvariants. Now, it's expected to be available later this week after the CDC signs off. And just one day after Drew Barrymore announced her talk show would return despite the ongoing writer's strike, two fans who attended the show's taping today say they were kicked out by security for wearing pins in support of the strikes. He was like, you're out. I already talked to people above me and I see that on your shirt. I'm part of the show, like you're out. No questions asked. Now, a spokesperson for the show responded saying, in part, they regret the fans were not allowed to access, not allowed access and are reaching out to offer them some new tickets. And a 14-year-old in Massachusetts is facing an attempted murder charge accused of trying to drown a black teen back in July, an incident prosecutors say was motivated by race. A court documents say the teen suspect repeatedly dunked the victim who could not swim into a pond and called him George Floyd. His lawyer telling the Boston Globe it was horseplay that got out of control. And is this a scene from Final Destination? Dash cam video in Utah caught the moment a chair's base came flying out of nowhere straight into the windshield of a car. Uh, you can see the impact shattered that glass. Only the person in the passenger seat was left with minor cuts. And call it a sugar union. The Smucker's brand, famous for its PB&J essentials, is set to buy Hostess brands, the makers of snack classics like Twinkies. The deal is worth a whopping $5.6 billion and is expected to close next year in April. And the governor of New Mexico is getting a lot of criticism over a new emergency order that suspends open and concealed carry laws in the city of Albuquerque. Now, this comes after a bunch of shootings there recently, including one that resulted in the death of a child. Take a listen. The purpose is to try to create a cooling off period while we figure out how we can better address public safety and gun violence. Now, a lot of people there are quite literally up in arms over the ban. Yesterday, protesters took to the streets to uh, demonstrate against that new rule. But it's not just those that are pushing back. Albuquerque's mayor, the police chief there, and a county sheriff are all vowing not to enforce the governor's ban. NBC's Priscilla Thompson joins us now. Priscilla, uh, can you walk us through the drama with this one? Can the mayor and the police chief just decide not to enforce something that the governor's put out? And what about those questions of whether or not this is even constitutional. Well, Gotti, that is exactly what these officials are raising when they are saying that they're not going to enforce this. They are saying that they have sworn an oath to defend the Constitution, and they feel that this order is unconstitutional. I want to play a little bit of what uh, the county sheriff there in Albuquerque had to say. Listen. Well, I understand the urgency, the temporary ban challenges the foundations of our Constitution, but most importantly, it is unconstitutional. My oath was to protect the Constitution, and that is what I will do. And he also said that he is concerned about potential civil liability for officers who do attempt to enforce this order, and also that those officers may be putting themselves at risk if they are approaching seemingly law-abiding, gun-carrying citizens and seeking to uh, potentially take those guns or something like that. And so these are some of the concerns that we're hearing raised by law enforcement and officials in Albuquerque who are being asked to enforce this order. Gotti? And Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, she's also getting backlash from people in her own party, right? That's right. You mentioned the mayor, but also the attorney, uh, the district attorney in Albuquerque, who was appointed by the governor, has said that he will not uh, enforce this order. And we're also hearing from the ACLU that is expressing concerns, saying that this could potentially create over policing and racial profiling in some communities if police and officers go in seeking those guns. And the ACLU is calling on the governor to use evidence based strategies like intervention and deterrent programs that are proven to address the root causes of this violence. And they're saying that this order is not the answer. Gotti. Priscilla Thompson, thanks so much. And coming up, one of the world's most active volcanoes erupting in Hawaii. That's ahead when we check the headlines tonight on the West Coast. 
Hey there, welcome back. And here are some of the stories that are happening on the West Coast that we're following tonight in Hawaii. The Kilauea volcano erupted over the weekend, ending a quiet two months for one of the most active volcanoes in the world. Officials have downgraded the alert level today and say there is no threat to people or property. And in San Francisco, just an incredible sight this morning. This huge sinkhole opened up in the streets there after a water main break. It not only caused major traffic headaches, but also flooded nearby homes. And city officials say it's all because of this water main break late last night. Crews worked through the night to control that situation, but they couldn't stop that massive sinkhole from opening up. And in Portland, Oregon, dancers at a strip club there become the second in the country to unionize. Dancers at the Magic Tavern say they are on strike because of unsafe working conditions, including gas leaks and poles that weren't installed correctly. The club's owners say dancers are independent contractors and can work wherever they want, but the Actors' Equity Association, which helped the dancers unionize, says that's not the case. The union says the dancers aren't independent because they don't decide on their own shifts, rates, or clients, and the dancers are hoping to reach a negotiation with the club. Meanwhile, the club remains open with non-unionized dancers on stage. And on the car manufacturing front, growing signs that by the end of the week, 150,000 auto workers could be on strike. Now, contract negotiations are still underway between Detroit's big three automakers and the United Auto Workers Union. Both sides have until Thursday night to come to some sort of agreement. But as of right now, it is not looking good. General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler's owner Stellantis have all submitted proposals, but the union has rejected all of them. And joining us now is NBC's business and data reporter, Brian Chung. Brian, uh, what are both sides asking for, and where do negotiations stand right now? Well, Gotti, the big sticking point appears to be wages, wages, wages. The United Auto Workers Union is asking for a 46 percent bump in wages compounded over the next four years. And the best offer from any of the three, at least right now, is coming from Stellantis, the maker of Chrysler vehicles. They're offering 14.5 percent increases in wages. So numerically, you can see just how far apart they are right now. There are other parts of these negotiations as well, when you talk about pensions for retirees in addition to health care. But again, the big sticking point appears to be wages. It's encouraging to see that the three automakers are all in conversation and at least had one round of offers each. But again, we only have until Thursday, 11.59 p.m. into midnight on Friday to avoid a strike. And industry contacts that I've heard from over the past few days have said it doesn't look good in terms of avoiding one, Gotti. Yeah, that seems like a massive gap. Now, I remember a 40-day strike back in 2019 cost automakers tens of billions of dollars, right? What kind of impact could we see if this happens? Yeah, well, some estimates from the likes of Goldman Sachs have said that for every week that a strike goes on, it could cost each automaker between two and a half to three billion dollars in lost revenues. But it's important to contextualize that within how much it would cost the companies to make the concessions that the UAW is asking for. And the same firm, Goldman Sachs, estimates that would be somewhere between four to six billion dollars for each of the automakers. You have other estimates like the Anderson Economic Group, which uh, is partially uh, in. Uh, uh, working with the uh, auto workers, because it's important to note that Ford and also GM are a kind of clients of that group, but they estimate it could be $5 billion of losses as well. So there's a lot to be lost here, but there's also a lot to be gained in terms of how much the automakers could pay out to the union. Again, we'll have to see how those numbers shake out in the days to come. Yeah, Brian Chung, always a pleasure. Thanks so much. And 22 years ago today, the United States and the world changed forever with the September 11 attacks. And this morning, in New York City, the vice president attended a moment of silence at Ground Zero. Bells rang at times. The hijacked planes hit the World Trade Center. And then in Washington, D.C., the names of all of those who died on Flight 77 and inside the Pentagon were read out loud. That plane slammed into the military headquarters. And at the Flight 93 Memorial Site in Pennsylvania, loved ones gathered to remember the passengers who tried to storm the cockpit before that plane crashed. NBC News' Rahim Ellis has a story. Once again, a solemn day of remembrance. Bells tolling at 8.46 and 9.03, the moment when terrorists attacked the World Trade Center 22 years ago. Alvin Peter Kappelman Jr. Then William the emotional reading of nearly 3,000 names of those who died that day. And my poppy, Gerard Patrick Frank, firefighter from Rescue Company 3. I miss you and love you. I wish we, you got to take me fishing. We love you, poppy. 
in attendance Vice President Kamala Harris, but President Biden under criticism from conservative outlets for being the first president not to be at the White House or a memorial site on the anniversary. Instead, he was visiting troops in Alaska. I join you on this solemn day to renew our sacred vow. Never forget never forget. And the tragedy is still present in so many families' lives to this day as they're struggling with lingering health effects from the attack. 341 members of the fire department have died from 9-11 related illnesses, almost as many as those who died 22 years ago. He was great. Jim Brosey's father, Joseph, was one of them. He died from lung cancer this year. Lieutenant Joseph Brosey, engine 88, and his name was added to a memorial wall at FDNY headquarters. I would walk through those hallways looking at names of people I worked with, people I knew, and the one thing you never want to see is one of your own family. Pain for lost family members, both fresh and lingering. I just hope you're proud of who I've grown up to be. Thank you for loving us, Dad, and thank you for being my dad. Tonight, a nation honoring a promise to never forget. Rahima Ellis, NBC News, New York. And coming up, the head of Spain's soccer federation is resigning after he was seen kissing a player after that World Cup win. Those details are coming up next. Hey there, welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world in 80 seconds. After facing weeks of protests and ongoing investigations, Spanish soccer chief Luis Rubiales has finally resigned. The resignation comes after he forcibly kissed Spanish women's soccer team player Jennifer Hermoso, who filed a criminal complaint against him. Rubiales says he now wants to focus on his dignity. Some friends very, very close to me, uh, and they say to me, Luis, now... You have to focus on your dignity and to continue your life. Robiales' resignation comes just days after the team's coach was also fired. And several people were wounded at the Texas-Mexico border this weekend after an armed civilian group attacked a convoy crossing over into Mexico. The convoy was carrying 20 people, 16 Mex Mexican nationals and four Americans. U.S. Customs and Border Protection says that seven people were transported to hospitals in the United States. And Afghanistan is now the world's fastest growing maker of meth. That's according to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes. The agency says that meth coming from Afghanistan has been seized in both European Union countries as well as East Africa. The Afghan health officials say that around 20,000 people are in local hospitals because of drug addiction and mostly because of meth. And at least 2,000 people are feared dead in Libya after some historic flooding there. Now, thousands are still missing, and a desperate search and rescue effort is underway. The massive flood ripped through the eastern part of the country after heavy storms over the weekend. And before we go, it is time for the future of everything, and Congress is getting back to work after a long recess. So what's at the top of their agenda? AI. The biggest leaders in artificial intelligence are headed to Washington to figure out how to regulate this thing, and those details are coming up next. So stay tuned. And in the future of everything, Congress is back in sex session, and a big focus this first week is going to be on artificial intelligence, and it's all going down behind closed doors at the Capitol on Wednesday. That's uh, what's officially being called the Senate's first AI Insight Forum. The brainstorming session is being organized by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who a few days ago had this to say about the legislative priorities surrounding AI. Watch. It will be one of the most difficult things we undertake. We must treat AI with the same level of seriousness as national security, as job creation, as our civil liberties. Now, the invite list is what everyone seems to be talking about. Some of the heaviest hitters set to attend, attend, including Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, and Sam Altman there. And Garrett Haake has more on what we can expect to come out of those sessions. Hey, Garrett. 
Gotti, what we're going to see this week on the Hill with AI is fairly unusual, especially this summit on Wednesday with all those CEOs you just laid out meeting behind closed doors with all 100 senators. This really is the brainchild of Chuck Schumer, who I'm told by an aide kind of realized a little while ago that AI was going to be one of those issues that could be society defining. And he didn't want Congress to get stuck behind it. I mean, how many hearings have you and I covered with these same lawmakers talking about social media or other kind of tech issues where you can tell they've been explained these issues by their grandkids and they just don't understand it. Schumer has made it clear he does not want to see that be the case with AI. So Wednesday summit is really about education and about an opportunity for these centers to hear from kind of the leading lights in the industry in a lower pressure situation. They're not going to grill these people. There's going to be no cameras. It's going to be totally behind closed doors. It's a learning opportunity for these lawmakers to get their heads around what does need to happen in the other hearings that they're going to have including some this week in the House and going forward in some of these Senate committees to start figuring out what kind of regulation is appropriate and what kind of regulation can pass so that Congress isn't totally on the back foot when it comes to AI. Now, look, we are a long way from anything, I think, really becoming law here because there is a lot of disagreement between the parties and even inside them about what's the best route to take. They want to encourage AI innovation in the United States to make sure the U.S. is a leader in AI, but they also want to regulate in a way that things don't get totally out of hand and out of control with technology that most of the country doesn't understand. So it's the first step, I think, in what's going to be a very long journey for Congress to try to make sure they don't get totally left behind on a very fast-changing issue that's front of mind for so many people all around the country. Dottie? Key words there, long journey. Garrett Haig, thanks so much. And that does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.